Hi, yes. Oh, gosh, you can hear me. Um, so, opera and beatbox. That's, I've never heard both. In fact, I'm not sure I've heard either before, but that's, that's both at the same time. So that's, that's a christening. Um, I'm an astronomer, an astrophysicist, and I w thought it was therefore logical to start talking about the eye. Um, the human eye is an incredible organ in your body. It's the second most complicated after your brain. Um, and it can focus on 50 objects a second, which is quite remarkable. Um, it also can distinguish 10 million different colors. And colors are what I wanted to talk to you about um, this evening. You might, I hope, remember this experiment from school. Um, maybe you've done it for fun since. Um, it's a triangular prism made of glass, and you pass a beam of white light into it. And what you see, what you get out the other end, is, is a rainbow, a spectrum. And that's because the white light going into the prism is made up of lots of different colors, lots of different wavelengths of light, all mixed together. And the prism kind of sorts them out by wavelength, because different wavelength objects refract differently as they pass through the material of the prism. So what happens is you get the shorter wavelength objects are refracted the most, the violet light, and then the longer wavelength, the red, that's refracted, refracted the least, and they spread out into this lovely rainbow. So I hope you remember this, because it's going to underpin everything I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> in the year 1800, this is the only bit of history I, I think I'm going to give you, um, a man named William Herschel uh, did an experiment. He was trying to understand which part of white light gave you the warmth that you feel from the sun. And he, to determine this, he set this up and he placed the thermometer under each of the colors. And he found that red was warmer than green, which was warmer than blue. So it seemed as he went up in wavelength, uh, although I don't know if he would have thought of it in that way, that he was feeling the heat more. And then he did something really clever, and he placed his thermometer beyond the red part. There's no light to see there, but he found that that was the warmest part of the spectrum. This red bit, which he called infrared, which is, means beyond the red. And then, spurred on by his result, a Polish scientist called Johann Ritter, a year later, used some uh, photographic chemicals to determine that at the other end, there was also radiation. He called them chemical rays, but we call it ultraviolet light. And in the space of two years, our entire view of what light was, was completely transformed. Now, we can see uh, this range of colors, wavelengths. So we can see everything from 390 nanometers up to 750. And what that means, if you really want to think about it, is that there's an electromagnetic field throughout the entire universe. And little variations in that field are what we perceive as light with our eyes. And we perceive variations in that field in that size range. So 390 nanometers is about one third of one thousandth of a millimeter. And 750 nanometers is just over two thirds of one thousandth of a millimeter. It's quite narrow. Um, but our brain, our eyes and our brain, can turn that into 10 million colors. Now, let's put this in the context of something much bigger. This is the electromagnetic spectrum. This is the full range of wavelengths in the variations in that electromagnetic field. And you're probably familiar with a lot of them. We have uh, radio. These are waves of the order of size of buildings. That's, that's a building there. And <laughs> They can even be as large as, say, kilometers big. We can go through there, we can go to microwaves. That's the stuff you use in your kitchen, in your microwave. It, those waves are of the order of centimeters big. And infrared, we've just talked about. Visible, there's the little tiny strip that we can see. Ultraviolet, that's back to Johann Ritter. Further on, we go to x-rays. That's what you use in, in hospital to look at your bones. That's because x-rays, very, very small wavelength. They just pass through anything because they're small. They're also very energetic and quite dangerous through to gamma rays. Gamma rays are variations. They're the size of an atomic nucleus. So we've gone from buildings to atomic nuclei. And that little bit that we can see is grossly exaggerated on this slide. <laughs> if you imagine that the full 10 million colors that your eye can perceive is an inch across, 
then the entire electromagnetic spectrum is 2,000 miles. It's about a billionth of the whole thing. And objects don't just act in one wavelength. And this is an important point. Here's an incandescent light bulb. The Wikimedia Commons Foundation is behind most of the images in this um, <laughs> talk, by the way. Um, you pass an electric current through a light bulb, and out comes light. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but maybe what you didn't know was that light bulbs really shouldn't be called light bulbs. They should be called infrared light bulbs. Because most of the radiation coming out of that light bulb, you can't see. It's in the infrared. And now you know this, you know that light bulbs are hot. That's because your skin is quite a good infrared detector. Um, but we just happen to catch, there's, if you imagine sort of wavelength as we had before across the middle there, and you imagine light bulbs, they, they don't just emanate one frequency, they spread out across all, all the frequencies, and they peak in the, in the ultraviolet, in the infrared, and we just catch the tail end in the visible, uh, which is why they often look red. And it's also why energy-saving light bulbs can put this, so much less power in and get just as much light. It's because they're simply focusing that output into the visible. It's also why they don't look as red and yellow when you take pictures in fluorescent lighting. Here's some images in the infrared, and this is what I want to get into. I want you to imagine you can see in the infrared. And you don't have to imagine it, because I can show you. Um, up in, in the top there, we've got a light bulb. That's a light bulb in my kitchen. Uh, I had a very fun day borrowing a thermal camera. Um, <laughs> I've shown far too many people these pictures. Um, 230 up there, that's, that's a temperature scale on the side. So that ha is a halogen lamp in my kitchen, you know, like the little spots you get on the ceiling. And that is at 230 degrees C. So it's giving you quite a lot of infrared radiation, although it looks not dissimilar to how it looks in, 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 in our optical vision. There's me holding a cup of coffee. I've got my mouth open to show you that the warmest part of that picture is inside my mouth. Um, which is normally the darkest part of a picture, and that's my body temperature, about 38 degrees, maybe I had a fever. Um, <laughs> we have a kettle there, boiling, just, uh, that's the outside of a kettle, so it's not quite at a boiling temperature, and this is the power brick of my laptop, um, which isn't far off my body temperature. So going back to efficiency there, and sustainability and energy from earlier talks, um, if you could see in the infrared, you'd see a quite a different world. And you'd see a different universe. Because let's get into the astronomy. This is the Andromeda Galaxy. Now, I'm just going to grab my little laser pointer here to show you a couple of things. Now, I don't know if anyone's seen the Andromeda Galaxy. You can see it with the naked eye. It doesn't look this impressive. This is a very long exposure photograph. Um, and what this is showing you is a galaxy. Now, we live in a galaxy. This is the closest galaxy to us. And Andromeda is very much like the galaxy we live in. It has this central point in the middle, lots of bright stars there. There's lots of things going on. It, it's a big swirling disk, okay? And these dark lanes that you can see here, these dark patches, um, those are dust lanes in the galaxy. And that's, you, you must have seen these images of big spiral galaxies. Well, this is a big spiral galaxy. We're just seeing it slightly from the side. 2.5 million light years away, um, 200,000 light years across, contains about 200 billion stars just like our galaxy and the billions and billions of other galaxies. I say that just because this is an astronomy talk and I feel I have to <laughs> point out how small everyone is. <laughs> um, but if we look at this in infrared, if we go to the Spitzer Space Telescope image of exactly the same thing, we see something quite different. This is, we're now looking at those same dust lanes. If I go back and forward, I'll watch the dust lanes. See, they're the pink bits we're looking at. What we see in the infrared is we strip away all the hot stuff. We're filtering in a different part of the spectrum. Well, on the diagram, it was that way. And we see the cold dust. This is stardust, essentially. This is what stars are made of, because what you're seeing is all the stars being formed in Andromeda. And it's only through infrared telescopes that we can see this sort of information. Now, infrared radiation is absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere, so we have to go into space to be able to see this stuff. Now we can do the same thing. Let's go the other way up the spectrum. Let's go to the ultraviolet. This is a Galax image. This is a UV image of the same thing. Now, what we've done now is we've done the reverse. There's no dust in this picture, because dust just doesn't radiate in the UV. And what we're seeing now are all the young stars. 
This is a radio image of Andromeda. This is an X-ray image of Andromeda. Now, this one's quite different because if you could see in the X-rays, if you were an X-ray alien, um, then you wouldn't call this a spiral galaxy at all. You'd call it a cluster of X-ray blobs. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure you'd be that interested in it. Maybe you would. It'd probably be very bright. But the point is that we get this multi-wavelength view of objects. And this is modern astronomy. This is astrophysics. This is how we understand what's going on. Here's a much more familiar object. This is the sun. Now, this is a video. You can see the number ticking up. This is the last month of the sun in, in photographs. And the date and the time are there. Oop, there's a sunspot. Um, you can see the sun in the visible um, isn't actually tremendously interesting. Um, there's some sunspots occasionally. There's another one coming around. And you can see the sun rotates about once a month. And we watch that from satellites, uh, space probes in space. Um, of course they are, they're space probes. And <laughs> but much more interesting is to go and look at the sun in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. Here, same data, but now seen. This one here is near ultraviolet, and this one is the much more extreme ultraviolet, they call it. And the colors are arbitrary. They've just been colored in because it's meaningless, right? So this, though, just look at how dynamic the sun is. It looks so quiet to the visible eye. But when you look at it in the ultraviolet, you get this incredible different view of a much more dynamic and active sun. And this is the radiation that, that can cause skin cancer. This is the stuff that the ozone layer blocks out. So again, we have to go into space. Of course, the ozone layer doesn't block it out so well in some parts of the world. But the sun, a proper multi-wavelength object, just like everything else. Here's a cool one. And you'll like this, because this is hot off the press. Uh, this was uh, shown yesterday at the National Astronomy Meeting in Glasgow. So I shoehorned it in. Um, this is the Rosette Nebula, a very lovely, serene object, a big, round, red nebula, which is why it's called the Rosette, perhaps, obviously. But there's a new satellite up in space, and it's called the Herschel Space Telescope. That's named for the same William Herschel that discovered infrared. And this thing is going to it's, it's incredible. It takes images in the far infrared to equal the quality of the images we see in optical in many cases. And this is one of those cases. So this is an overlay of Herschel data. So you're now seeing the stardust again. And if I progress a little further and zoom in, there we go, you can see this. It looks like an oil painting to me. Um, these blobs here. These are new solar systems being formed inside the Rosette Nebula. These are protostars and accretion disks around protostars. And soon there'll be planets and, and all sorts of things. It's only by looking in these other wavelengths we can understand how Earth came to be and how our universe is the way that it is. And I'm just going to flip out of my presentation briefly into this thing. Oh, hello, I just went back in, didn't I? There it is. This is something called Chromoscope. This is a, a tool, free tool, Google it. Um, you can use this to look at the sky in multi-wavelengths. And what, here's visible. Now, what we're seeing is a projection of the whole sky. And what I want you to imagine is that Andromeda galaxy picture from earlier, um, that big swirling spiral galaxy. Now, if you remember, we live inside a big swirling spiral galaxy. So this is our view because we're seeing through that big swirly spiral galaxy. So the big bulge is still there in the middle. That's the center of the galaxy. The dust lanes that you saw before are now seen as this line across the middle. So if you think about it, we're inside it now. So we see the dust across. And then you can see the shape of that disk, that bulge in the middle across there out to nothing. And we can, we can move around and see that it really does trail off over on the side. So this is our own galaxy seen from within. And we can look at that in other wavelengths. And we're going to look at it in the far infrared again. So we scroll through. Slightly different. Um, the far infrared just comes alive in the night sky. And those dark dust lanes are now these big glowing bands in the middle. And again, this is all the stardust. This is stars forming. And it belies something uh, truly amazing about the universe, which is like a light bulb. The whole universe doesn't actually emit all that much in the visible. We just see that bit. 
fully half of all the radiation that we can detect is in the infrared. So like a light bulb, maybe the universe needs to get more efficient for our sake. Um, I don't know why I just did that. That was the wrong button. So I'm going to finish on this image. Any guesses? It um, looks a bit like a potato. Um, it's actually something fairly familiar to you, which is that it's planet Earth. It's planet Earth viewed in gamma rays. Now, there's a, this was from a space probe that went up. I, I think it was called uh, Egret. Um, gamma ray radiation, the extremely high energy radiation that we don't get on Earth, we're protected from it by the Earth's atmosphere. And because of that, the Earth in gamma rays looks this white bit around the edge is where all the gamma rays are. There's nothing in the middle. The Earth in gamma rays looks like a hollow ball. And in the visible, obviously, we see it's not. Because appearances really are deceptive. And if you were a gamma ray alien, maybe you wouldn't stop by, or maybe you'd be curious as to why there was a giant hollow ball orbiting a star. But I don't know. I don't know what you'd see a star as, I suppose. That one inch of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can see with our eyes, those 10 million colors, that's all we've got. I don't see any way we're going to be able to expand our eyes with surgery or something out into seeing other wavelengths. But science and technology enable us to peer into this hidden world that's all around us. If you could see in the radio and, and other wavelengths, then you would see something quite different to what you see in the visible. For a start, if you could see in the radio, you'd see Wi-Fi bouncing off all the walls, and the sky would be filled with these bizarre radio rainbows all the time, and, and the night sky would look fantastic in the radio. I won't, I won't show you. <laughs> um, I get carried away. Um, but the point is that science and technology are allowing us to expand that one inch outward into 2,000 miles. And although your eyes can't open that wide, maybe your imagination can, and that will let you access the whole of the hidden universe. And I'll leave you with that quote. Thank you. <laughs>